Ah, my dear guest, welcome once again to Phantom Mansion. I, of course, am Dr. Grendel, your host. As before, I am delighted to receive your visit. This is a most auspicious occasion, as I am about to unveil the latest of my experiments. As you may recall, my servant Boris, with your assistance, has made a major contribution to this experiment. Of course, he was somewhat reluctant and squeamish at first, but in time, I and my whip persuaded him that it is a noble deed to make sacrifices for science. In any case, Boris submitted and I was able to complete the procedure. What kind of procedure, you may ask? Oh, a rather simple yet revolutionary procedure that will undoubtedly be a marvel to behold. Let us call it a transplant. Come, let us adjourn to the library to see how our subject is recuperating, shall we? And how are you feeling, Boris? I trust you are suffering no ill effects from the... sedative? I am well, Master. <laughs> the sedative must be wearing off. My clearing is much thinker than before. <laughs> Yes, well, try not to tax yourself for the time being. I need time to monitor your new appendage. Yes, Master. I should explain, my dear guest. You may recall that during your previous visit, I mentioned we could always use an extra hand in the laboratory. My meaning was quite literal. You might be interested to know that I have transplanted the hand of a woman onto Boris's arm. Thus far, the reconnective procedure seems to have worked. There has been neither nerve nor tissue damage to speak of. Boris, why did you slap yourself? Uh, I, I couldn't help it, Master. The hand keeps slapping me in the face whenever I think evil thoughts. <laughs> well, why don't you exert more self-control, Boris? After all, this is your hand now. It simply will not do for you to try and do your chores here at the mansion while slapping yourself. It would tend to undermine the dignity of this noble estate. Yes, Master. The trouble is that every time I think about taking control of the hand, it slips me even harder. Now remember, Boris, a house divided against itself cannot stand. Perhaps it was the sedatives I used. The hand must still think it is attached to its former host. Perhaps if I remove it, I can replace it with an appendage that will be more... receptive to your control. Yes, Master. <laughs> the, the sedatives must be the problem, and... Uh, wait! What do you mean? Yes, Boris, the only way I can assure the hand no longer attacks you is if I remove it without the use of an anesthetic. Otherwise, even after it is no longer attached, it could present a threat to you and the other inhabitants of Phantom Mansion. But, but, but Master, to remove the hand without anesthetic, wouldn't that be painful? Have no fear, Boris. I won't feel a thing. <laughs> The 
this may take some time, dear guest. Perhaps while you are waiting you might find to your liking a tale of terror which, by a strange coincidence, also concerns a hand, and a foot, and an arm, and a torso. All of them with a mind of their own. <laughs> the Return of the Sorcerer by Clark Ashton Smith I had been out of work for several months, and my savings were perilously near the vanishing point. Therefore, I was naturally elated when I received from John Carnby a favorable answer inviting me to present my qualifications in person. Carnby had advertised for a secretary, stipulating that all applicants must offer a preliminary statement of their capacities by letter. And I had written in response to the advertisement, Carnby, no doubt, was a scholarly recluse who felt averse to contact with a long waiting list of strangers, and he had chosen this manner of weeding out beforehand many, if not all, of those who were ineligible. He had specified his requirements fully and succinctly, and these were of such nature as to bar even the average well-educated person. A knowledge of Arabic was necessary, among other things, and luckily I had acquired a certain degree of scholarship in this unusual tongue. I found the address, of whose location I had formed only a vague idea, at the end of a hilltop avenue in the suburbs of Oakland. It was a large, two-story house overshaded by ancient oaks and dark with a mantling of unchecked ivy among heavy hedges of unpruned privet and shrubbery that had gone wild for many years. It was separated by, from its neighbors by a vacant, weed-grown lot on one side and a tangle of vines and trees on the other, surrounding the black ruins of a burnt mansion. Even apart from its air of long neglect, there was something drear and dismal about the place, something that inhered in the ivory-blurred outlines of the house and the furtive, shadowy windows and the very forms of the misshapen oaks and oddly sprawling shrubbery. Somehow, my elation became a trifle less exuberant as I entered the grounds and followed an unswept path to the front door. When I found myself in the presence of John Carnby, my jubilation was still somewhat further diminished, though I could not have given a tangible reason for the premonitory chill, the dull somber feeling of alarm that I experienced and the leaden sinking of my spirits. Perhaps it was the dark library in which he received me as much as the man himself, a room whose musty shadows could never have been wholly dissipated by sun or lamplight. Indeed, it must have been this, for John Conby himself was very much the sort of person I had pictured him to be. He had all the earmarks of the lonely scholar who has devoted patient years to some line of erudite research. He was thin and bent, with a massive forehead and a mane of grizzled hair, and the pallor of the library was on his hollow, clean-shaven cheeks. But coupled with this, there was a nerve-shattered air, a fearful shrinking that was more than the normal shyness of a recluse, and an unceasing apprehensiveness that betrayed itself in every glance of his dark-ringed, feverish eyes, 
and every movement of his bony hands. In all likelihood, his health had been seriously impaired by over-application, and I could not help but wonder at the nature of the studies that had made him a tremulous wreck. But there was something about him, perhaps the width of his bowed shoulders and the bold aquilinity of his facial outlines, which gave the impression of great former strength and a vigor not yet wholly exhausted. His voice was unexpectedly deep and sonorous. I think you will do, Mr. Ogden, he said after a few formal questions, most of which related to my linguistic knowledge and, in particular, my mastery of Arabic. Your labors will not be very heavy, but I want someone who can be on hand at any time required. Therefore, you must live with me. I can give you a comfortable room, and I guarantee that my cooking will not poison you. I often work at night, and I hope you will not find the irregular hours too disagreeable. No doubt I should have been overjoyed at this assurance that the secretarial position was to be mine. Instead, I was aware of a dim, unreasoning reluctance and an obscure forewarning of evil as I thanked John Carnby and told him that I was ready to move in whenever he desired. He appeared greatly pleased, and the queer apprehensiveness went out of his manner for a moment. Come, me, come immediately, this very afternoon if you can, he said. I shall be very glad to have you, and the sooner the better. I have been living entirely alone for some time, and I must confess that the solitude is beginning to pall upon me. I also have been retarded in my labors for lack of the proper help. My brother used to live with me and assist me, but he has gone away on a long trip. I returned to my downtown lodgings, paid my rent with the last few dollars that remained to me, packed my belongings, and in less than an hour was back at my new employer's home. He assigned me a room on the second floor, which, though unaired and dusty, was more than luxurious in comparison with the hall bedroom that failing funds had compelled me to inhabit for some time past. Then he took me to his own study, which was on the same floor, at the further end of the hall. Here, he explained to me, was where most of my future work would be done. I could hardly restrain an exclamation of surprise as I viewed the interior of this chamber. It was very much as I should have imagined the den of some old sorcerer to be. There were tables strewn with archaic instruments of doubtful use, with astrological charts with skulls and alembics and crystals, with censers such as are used in the Catholic Church, and volumes bound in worm-eaten leather with verdigris mottled clasps. In one corner stood the skeleton of a large ape, in another a human skeleton, and overhead a stuffed crocodile was suspended. There were cases overpiled with books, and even a cursory glance at the titles showed me that they formed a singularly comprehensive collection of ancient and modern works on demonology and the black arts. There were some weird paintings and etchings on the walls, dealing with kindred themes, and the whole atmosphere of the room exhaled a medley of half-forgotten superstitions. Ordinarily, I would have smiled if confronted with such things, but somehow, in this lonely, 
dismal house beside the neurotic had hag ridden Conby. It was difficult for me to repress an actual shudder. On one of the tables, contrasting incongruously with this melange of medievalism and Satanism, there stood a typewriter, surrounded with piles of disorderly manuscript. At one end of the room there was a small curtained alcove with a bed in which Conby slept. At the end opposite the alcove, between the human and simian skeletons, I perceived the locked cupboard that was set in the wall. Conby had noted my surprise and was watching me with a keen, analytic expression which I found impossible to fathom. He began to speak in explanatory tones. I have made a life study of demonism and sorcery, he declared. It is a fascinating field, and one that is singularly neglected. I am now preparing a monograph in which I am trying to correlate the magical practices and demon worship of every known age and people. Your labors, at least for a while, will consist in typing and arranging the voluminous preliminary notes which I have made, and in helping me to track down other references and correspondences. Your knowledge of Arabic will be invaluable to me, for I am none too well grounded in this language myself, and I am depending for certain essential data on a copy of the Necronomicon in the original Arabic text. I have reason to think that there are certain omissions and erroneous renderings in the Latin version of Olaus Wormius. I had heard of this rare, well-nigh fabulous volume, but had never seen it. The book was supposed to contain the ultimate secrets of evil and forbidden knowledge, and moreover the original text, written by the mad Arab Abdul al Hazred, was said to be unprocurable. I wondered how it had come into Kandi's possession. I'll show you the volume after dinner, Carnby went on. You will doubtless be able to elucidate one or two passages that have long puzzled me. The evening meal, cooked and served by my employer himself, was a welcome change from cheap restaurant fare. Carnby seemed to have lost a good deal of his nervousness. He was very talkative, and even began to exhibit a certain scholarly gaiety after we had shared a bottle of mellow sauter. Still, with no manifest reason, I was troubled by intimations and forebodings which I could neither analyze nor trace to their rightful source. We returned to the study, and Conby brought out from a locked drawer the volume of which he had spoken. It was enormously old, and was bound in ebony covers, arabesqued with silver, and set with darkly glowing garnets. When I opened the yellowing pages, I drew back with involuntary revulsion at the odor which arose from them, an odor that was more than suggestive of physical decay as if the book had lain among corpses in some forgotten graveyard and had taken on the taint of dissolution. Carnby's eyes were burning with a fevered light as he took the old manuscript from my hands and turned to a page near the middle. He indicated a certain passage with his lean forefinger. Tell me what you make of this, 
he said in a tense, excited whisper. I deciphered the paragraph, slowly and with some difficulty, and wrote down a rough English version with the pad and pencil which Carnby offered me. Then, at his request, I read it aloud. It is verily known by few, but is nevertheless no attestable fact that the will of a dead sorcerer hath power upon his own body, and can raise it up from the tomb, and perform therewith whatever action was unfulfilled in life. And such resurrections are invariably for the doing of malevolent deeds and for the detriment of others. Most readily can the corpse be animated if all its members have remained intact, and yet there are cases in which the excelling will of the wizard hath reared up from death the sundered pieces of a body hewn in many fragments, and hath caused them to serve his end either separately or in a temporary reunion, but in every instance after the action hath been completed, the body lapseth into its former state. Of course all this was errant gibberish. Probably it was the strange, unhealthy look of utter absorption with which my employer listened more than that damnable passage from the Necronomicon, which caused my nervousness and made me start violently when, toward the end of my reading, I heard an indescribable slithering noise in the hall outside. But when I finished the paragraph and looked up at Carnby, I was more startled by the expression of stark, staring fear which his features had assumed, an expression as of one who is haunted by some hellish phantom. Somehow I got the feeling that he was listening to that odd noise in the hallway rather than to my translation of Abdul al -Hazra. The house is full of rats, he explained as he caught my inquiring glance. I have never been able to get rid of them with all my effort. The noise which still continued was that which a rat might make in dragging some object slowly along the floor. It seemed to draw closer to approach the door of Carnby's room, and then, after an intermission, it began to move again and proceeded. My employer's agitation was marked. He listened with fearful intentness and seemed to follow the progress of the sound with a terror that mounted as it drew near and decreased a little with its recession. I am very nervous, he said. I have worked too hard lately, and this is the result. Even the little noise upsets me. The sound had now died away somewhere in the house. Carnby appeared to recover himself in a measure. Will you please reread your translation, he requested. I want to follow it very carefully, word by word. I obeyed. He listened with the same look of unholy absorption as before, and this time we were not interrupted by any noises in the hallway. Carnby's face grew paler as if the last remnant of blood had been drained from it when I read the final sentences, and the fire in his hollow eyes was like phosphorescence in a deep vault. That is a most remarkable passage, he commented. I was doubtful about its meaning with my imperfect Arabic, and I have found that the passage is wholly omitted in the Latin of Olaus Wormius. Thank you for your scholarly rendering. You have certainly cleared it up for me.
His tone was dry and formal, as if he were repressing himself and holding back a world of unsurmisable thoughts and emotions. Somehow I felt that Carnby was more nervous and upset than ever and also that my rendering from the Necronomicon had in some mysterious manner contributed to his perturbation. He wore a ghastly, brooding expression, as if his mind were busy with some unwelcome and forbidden theme. However, seeming to collect himself, he asked me to translate another passage. This turned out to be a singular, incantatory formula for the exorcism of the dead, with a ritual that involved the use of rare Arabian spices and the proper intoning of at least a hundred names of ghouls and demons. I copied it all out for Carnby, who studied it for a long time, of rapt eagerness that was more than scholarly. That, too, is not in Olaus Wormius, he observed. After perusing it again, he folded the paper carefully and put it away in the same drawer from which he had taken the Necronomicon. That evening was one of the strangest I have ever spent. As we sat for hour after hour discussing renditions from that unhallowed volume, I came to know more and more definitely that my employer was mortally afraid of something, that he dreaded being alone and was keeping me with him on this account, rather than for any other reason. Always he seemed to be waiting and listening with a painful, tortured expectation, and I saw that he gave only a mechanical awareness to much that was said. Among the weird appurtenances of the room, in that atmosphere of unmanifested evil, of untold horror, the rational part of my mind began to succumb slowly to a recrudescence of dark, ancestral fears. A scorner of such things in my normal moments, I was now ready to believe in the most baleful creations of superstitious fancy. No doubt, by some process of mental contagion, I had caught the hidden terror from which Carnby suffered. By no word or syllable, however, did the man admit the actual feelings that were evident in his demeanor, but he spoke repeatedly of a nervous ailment. More than once during our discussion he sought to imply that his interest in the supernatural and the satanic was wholly intellectual, that he, like myself, was without personal belief in such things. Yet I knew infallibly that his implications were false, that he was driven and obsessed by a real faith in all that he pretended to view with scientific detachment and had doubtless been a victim to some imaginary horror entailed by his occult researches. But my intuition afforded me no clue to the actual nature of this horror. There was no repetition of the sounds that had been so disturbing to my employer. We must have sat till after midnight with the writings of the mad Arab open before us. At last Carnby seemed to realize the lateness of the hour. I fear I have kept you up too long, he said apologetically. You must go and get some sleep. I am selfish, and I forget that such hours are not habitual to others as they are to me. I made the formal denial of his self-impeachment which courtesy required, said good night, and sought my own chamber with a feeling of intense relief. 
It seemed to me that I would leave behind me in Conby's room all the shadowy fear and oppression to which I had been subjected. Only one light was burning in the long passage. It was near Conby's door, and my own door at the further end, close to the stairhead, was in deep shadow. As I groped for the knob, I heard a noise behind me, and turned to see in the gloom a small, indistinct body that sprang from the hall landing to the top stair, disappearing from view. I was horribly startled, for even in that vague, fleeting glimpse the thing was much too pale for a rat, and its form was not at all suggestive of an animal. I could not have sworn what it was, but the outlines had seemed unmentionably monstrous. I stood trembling violently in every limb and heard on the stairs a singular bumping sound, like the fall of an object rolling downward from step to step. The sound was repeated at regular intervals and finally ceased. If the safety of the soul and body had depended upon it, I could not have turned on the stairlight, nor could I have gone to the top steps to ascertain the agency of that unnatural bumping. Anyone else, it might seem, would have done this. Instead, after a moment of virtual petrification, I entered my room, locked the door, and went to bed in a turmoil of unresolved doubt and equivocal terror. I left the light burning, and I lay awake for hours, expecting momentarily a recurrence of that abominable sound. But the house was as silent as a morgue, and I heard nothing. At length, in spite of my anticipations to the contrary, I fell asleep, and did not awaken till after many sodden dreamless hours. It was ten o'clock, as my watch informed me. I wondered whether my employer had left me undisturbed through thoughtfulness, or had not arisen himself. I dressed, and went downstairs to find him waiting at the breakfast table. He was paler and more tremulous than ever, as if he had slept badly. I hope the rats didn't annoy you too much, he remarked, after a preliminary greeting. Something really must be done about them. I didn't notice them at all, I replied. Somehow it was utterly impossible for me to mention the queer, ambiguous thing which I had seen and heard on retiring the night before. Doubtless I had been mistaken. Doubtless it had been merely a rat, after all, dragging something down the stairs. I tried to forget the hideously repeated noise and the momentary flash of unthinkable outlines in the gloom. My employer eyed me with uncanny sharpness, as if he sought to penetrate my inmost mind. Breakfast was a dismal affair, and the day that followed was no less dreary. Carnby isolated himself till the middle of the afternoon, and I was left to my own devices in the well-supplied but conventional library downstairs. What Carnby was doing alone in his room I could not surmise, but I thought more than once that I heard the faint, monotonous intonations of a solemn voice horror-breeding hints and noisome intuitions invaded my brain. More and more the atmosphere of that house enveloped and stifled me with poisonous, miasmal mystery, and I felt everywhere the invisible brooding of malignance and incubi.
It was almost a relief when my employer summoned me to his study. Entering, I noticed that the air was full of a pungent aromatic smell and was touched by the vanishing coils of a blue vapor, as if from the burning of oriental gums and spices in the church censers. An Ispahan rug had been moved from its position near the wall to the center of the room, but was not sufficient to cover entirely a curving, violet mark that suggested the drawing of a magic circle on the floor. No doubt Carnby had been performing some sort of incantation, and I thought of the awesome formula I had translated at his request. However, he did not offer any explanation of what he had been doing. His manner had changed remarkably and was more controlled and confident than at any former time. In a fashion almost businesslike, he laid before me a pile of manuscript which he wanted me to type for him. The familiar click of the keys aided me somewhat in dismissing any apprehensions of vague evil and I could almost smile at the recherche and terrific information comprised in my employer's notes, which dealt mainly with formulae for the acquisition of unlawful power. But still, beneath my reassurance, there was a vague, lingering disquietude. Evening came. After our meal, we returned again to the study, there was a tenseness in Conby's manner now, as if he were eagerly awaiting the result of some hidden test. I went on with my work, but some of his emotion communicated itself to me, and ever and anon I caught myself in an attitude of strained listening. At last, Above the click of the keys, I heard the peculiar slithering in the hall. Carnby had heard it too, and his confident look utterly vanished, giving place to the most pitiable fear. The sound drew nearer and was followed by a dull dragging noise, and then by more sounds of an unidentifiable slithering and scuttling nature that varied in loudness. The hall was seemingly full of them, as if a whole army of rats were hauling some carrion booty along the floor, and yet no rodent or number of rodents could have made such sounds, or could have moved anything so heavy as the object which came behind the rest. There was something in the character of those noises, something without name or definition, which caused a slowly creeping chill to invade my spine. Good lord, what is all that racket? I cried. The red! I tell you, it is only the red! Carnby's voice was a high, hysterical shriek. A moment later, there came an unmistakable knocking on the door, near the sill. At the same time, I heard a heavy thudding at the locked cupboard at the further end of the room. Carnby had been standing erect, but now he sank limply into a chair. His features were ashen, and his look was almost maniacal in fright. The nightmare doubt and tension became unbearable, and I ran to the door and flung it open in spite of a frantic remonstrance from my employer. I had no idea what I should find as I stepped across the sill into the dim-lit hall. When I looked down and saw the thing on which I had almost trodden, my feeling was one of sick amazement and actual nausea. It was a human hand which had been severed at the wrist. 
a bony, bluish hand like that of a weak old corpse with garden mold on the fingers and under the long nails. The damnable thing had moved! It had drawn back to avoid me and was crawling along the passage somewhat in the manner of a crab. Following it with my gaze, I saw that there were other things beyond it, one of which I recognized as a man's foot and another as a forearm. I dared not look at the rest. All were moving slowly, hideously away in a charnel procession, and I cannot describe the fashion in which they moved. Their individual vitality horrifying beyond endurance. It was more than the vitality of life, yet the air was laden with a carry of taint. I averted my eyes and stepped back into Carnby's room, closing the door behind me with a shaking hand. Carnby was at my side with the key, which he turned in the lock with palsy-stricken fingers that had become as feeble as those of an old man. You saw them? he asked in a dry, quavering whisper. In God's name, what does it all mean? I cried. Carnby went back to his chair tottering a little with weakness. His lineaments were agonized by the gnawing of some inward horror. And he shook visibly like an, like a patient of some kind of ailment. I sat down in a chair beside him, and he began to stammer forth his unbelievable confession, half incoherently, with inconsequential mouthings and many breaks and pauses. He is stronger than I am, even in death with his body dismembered by the surgeon's knife and saw that I used. I thought he could not return after that, after I buried the portions in a dozen different places, in the cellar beneath the shrubs, at the foot of the ivy vines, but the Necronomicon is right, and Helmand Carnby knew it. He warned me before I killed him. He told me he could return, even in that condition. But I did not believe him. I hated Helmand, and he hated me too. He had attained to higher power and knowledge, and was more favored by the Dark Ones than I. That was why I killed him, my own twin brother, and my brother in the service of Satan, and of those who were before Satan. We had studied together for many years, we had celebrated the Black Mass together, and were attended by the same familiars. But Helmand Carnby had gone deeper into the occult, into the Forbidden, where I could not follow him. I feared him, and I could not endure his supremacy. It is more than a week. It is ten days since I did the deed, but Helman, or some part of him, has returned every night. God, his accursed hands crawling on the floor, his feet, his arms, the segments of his legs climbing the stairs in some unmentionable way to taunt me. Christ, his awful bloody torso, lying in wait. I tell you, his hands have come even by day to tap and fumble at my door, and I have stumbled over his arms in the dark. Oh, God, I shall go mad with the awfulness of it. But he wants me to go mad. He wants to torture me till my brain gives way. That is why he haunts me in this piecemeal fashion. He could end it all any time with the demoniacal power that is his. But he could re-knit his sundered limbs and body and slay me as I slew him. Oh, how carefully I buried the parts with what infinite forethought and how useless it was. I buried the saw and knife, too, at the farther end of the garden as far away as possible from his evil itching hands. But I did not bury the head with the other pieces, oh no. I kept it in that cupboard at the end of my room. Sometimes I have heard it moving there, as you heard it a little while ago, but he does not need the head. 
His will is elsewhere, and can work intelligently through all his members. Of course, I locked all the doors and windows at night when I found that he was coming back, but it made no difference, and I have tried to exorcise him with the appropriate incantations. With all that I knew, today I tried that sovereign formula from the Necronomicon, which you translated for me. I got you here to translate it. Also, I could no longer bear to be alone, and I thought that it might help if there was someone else in the house. That my that formula was my last hope, and I, I thought it would hold him. It is a most ancient and most dreadful incantation, but as you have seen, it is useless. His voice trailed off in a broken mumble, and he sat staring before him with sightless, intolerable eyes, in which I saw the beginning flare of madness. I could say nothing. The confession he had made was so inept and atrocious. The moral shock and the ghastly supernatural horror almost stupefied me. My sensibilities were stunned, and it was not till I had begun to recover that I felt the irresistible surge of a flood of loathing for the man beside me. I rose to my feet. The house had grown very silent, as if the macabre charnel army of beleaguerment had now retired to its various graves. Carnby had left the key in the lock, and I went to the door and turned it quickly. Are you leaving? Don't go, Carnby begged in a voice that was tremulous with alarm as I stood with my hand on the doorknob. Yes, I am going, I said coldly. I am resigning my position right now, and I intend to pack my belongings and leave your house with as little delay as possible. I opened the door and went out, refusing to listen to the arguments and pleadings and protestations he had begun to babble. For the nonce, I preferred to face whatever might lurk in the gloomy passage, no matter how loathsome and terrifying, rather than endure any longer the society of John Carnby. The hall was empty, but I shuddered with repulsion at the memory of what I had seen as I hastened to my room. I think I should have screamed aloud at the least sound or movement in the shadows. I began to pack my valise with a feeling that the most frantic urgency and compulsion were necessary. It seemed to me that I could not escape soon enough from that house of abominable secrets, over which hung an atmosphere of smothering menace. I made mistakes in my haste, I stumbled over chairs, and my brain and fingers grew numb with a paralyzing dread. I had almost finished my task when I heard the sound of slow, measured footsteps coming up the stairs. I knew that it was not Carnby, for he had locked himself immediately in his room when I had left, and I felt sure that nothing could have tempted him to emerge. Anyway, he could hardly have gone downstairs without my hearing him. The footsteps came to the top landing and went past my door along the wall with that same dead, monotonous repetition, regular as the movement of a machine. Certainly, it was not the soft, nervous tread of John Carnby. Who then could it be? My blood stood still in my veins. I dared not finish the speculation that arose in my mind. The steps paused, and I knew that they had reached the door of Carnby's room. There followed an interval in which I could scarcely breathe. Then I heard an awful crash and shattering noise, and above it the soaring scream of a man in the utmost extremity of fear. I was powerless to move as if an unseen iron hand had reached forth to restrain me, and I have no idea how long I waited and listened. The scream had fallen away, and 
a swift silence, and I heard nothing now except a low, peculiar, recurrent sound, which my brain refused to identify. It was not my own volition, but a stronger will than mine, which drew me forth at last and impelled me down the hall to Carnby's study. I felt the presence of that will as an overpowering superhuman thing, a demoniac force, a malign mesmerism. The door of the study had been broken in and was hanging by one hinge. It was splintered as by the impact of more than mortal strength. A light was still burning in the room, and the unmentionable sound I had been hearing ceased as I neared the threshold. It was followed by an evil, utter stillness. Again I paused and could go no further, but this time it was something other than the hellish, all-pervading magnetism that petrified my limbs and arrested me before the sill. Peering into the room, in the narrow space that was framed by the doorway and lit by an unseen lamp, I saw one end of the oriental rug and the gruesome outlines of a monstrous, unmoving shadow that fell beyond it on the floor. Huge, elongated, misshapen, the shadow was seemingly cast by the arms and torso of a naked man who stooped forward with a surgeon's saw in his hand. Its monstrosity lay in this, though the shoulders, chest, abdomen, and arms were all clearly, indis clearly distinguishable. The shadow was headless, headless, and appeared to terminate in an abruptly severed neck. It was impossible, considering the relative position, for the head to have been concealed from sight through any manner of foreshortening. I waited, powerless to enter or withdraw. The blood had flowed back upon my heart in an ice-thick tide, and thought was frozen in my brain. An interval of termless horror, and then, from the hidden end of Carnby's room, from the direction of the locked cupboard, there came a fearsome and violent crash. The sound of splintering wood whining hinges, followed by the sinister, dismal thud of an unknown object striking the floor. Again, there was silence. A silence as of consummated evil brooding above its unnameable triumph. The shadow had not stirred. There was a hideous contemplation in its attitude. The saw was still held in its poising hand, as if above a completed task. Another interval, and then without warning I witnessed the awful and unexplainable disintegration of the shadow which seemed to break gently and easily into many different shadows ere it faded from view. Hesitate to describe the manner or specify the places in which this singular disruption, this manifold cleavage, occurred. Simultaneously, I heard the muffled clatter of a metallic implement on the Persian rug, and a sound that was not that of a single body, but of many bodies fallen. Once more, there was silence. A silence as of some nocturnal cemetery when grave diggers and ghouls are done with their macabre toil and the dead alone remain. Drawn by that baleful mesmerism, like a somnambulist led by an unseen demon, I entered the room. I knew with a loathly prescience the sight that awaited me beyond the sill. The double heap of human segments, some of them fresh and bloody, and others already blue with beginning putrefaction and marked with earth stains that were mingled in abhorrent confusion on the rug. A 
reddened knife and saw were protruding from the pile and a little to one side between the rug and the open cupboard with its shattered door there reposed a human head that was fronting the other remnants in an upright posture. It was in the same condition of incipient decay as the body to which it had belonged. But I swear that I saw the fading of a malignant exultation from its features as I entered. Even with the marks of corruption upon them, the lineaments bore a manifest likeness of John Carnby, and plainly they could be long, long only to a twin brother. The frightful inferences that smothered my brain with their black and clammy cloud are not to be written here. The horror which I beheld, and the greater horror which I surmised, would have put to shame hell's foulest enormities in their frozen heads. There was but one mitigation and one mercy. I was compelled to gaze only for a few instants on that intolerable scene. Then all at once I felt that something had withdrawn from the room. The malign spell was broken, the overpowering volition that once held me captive was gone. It had released me now, even as, as it had released the dismembered corpse of Helmut Carnby. I was free to go. And I fled from the ghastly chamber and ran headlong through an unlit house and into the outer darkness of the night. Quite a cautionary tale, wouldn't you say, dear guest? A shame how their others went to pieces. <laughs> As you can see, I have completed the procedure. The specimen hand has been removed and I have replaced it with Boris's own hand. He'll be quite alright. Once he recovers from the shock, he'll be his old self once again. In the meantime, we'll let him recover. And as the night draws to a close, so does this episode of Phantasm Theatre. I bid you farewell, dear guest. And I should like to remind you to proceed with caution as you leave. The monstrous denizens of Phantom Mansion are quite... fond of visitors. Ha 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 